You know, there are many old standbys that have been around for a while, like acrylic and paper and metal and glass, but plant-based compostable straws are starting to really rise up. And so bamboo and hay are, are kind of becoming a big thing. From Edible Communities, this is Joy Manning, and you're listening to the Edible Potluck Podcast. Today, we're going to Kentucky to talk with Edible Louisville and the Bluegrass Managing Editor, Ann Curtis, about why some restaurants there are eliminating plastic straws. And then we're off to Hawaii for a little coffee talk with Edible Hawaiian Islands contributor and coffee scientist, Sean Steinman. But first, let me tell you about a recipe I made last week that I think you might like too. It stars an unusual ingredient, parsnips. I found this recipe in Edible Vancouver in wine country, and what drew me in most was, honestly, the photo. It's just one of those food photos where the food looks so alluring you need to immediately head to your kitchen and make it. We have golden parsnips sitting in a baking dish that is red enameled cast iron, and you can see little brown bits stuck to the bottom of the pan. Um, I was really sold right away. And then when I saw that the ingredients list was so short— Just parsnips, olive oil, honey, salt and pepper, and nutmeg? I was intrigued, especially by that nutmeg. I don't usually season my roasted vegetables with much of anything, but nutmeg was really something that was out of the box for me. I happened to have parsnips on hand, so I started making it right away. Of course, I'm going to share a link to this recipe with you in the show notes for this episode, but you barely even need the recipe, I'm telling you. Um, The trickiest part was cutting up the parsnips because if you've, you know, worked with parsnips, you know they're pretty fat on the top. And then skinny at the bottom, and you like things to be cut evenly for even cooking. You know, you don't want some pieces that are mushy where some pieces are raw. So I just basically used my judgment to cut them into sort of finger length and size pieces as best I could. Then I tossed the parsnips with two tablespoons olive oil, two tablespoons honey, plenty of salt and pepper, and of course that nutmeg. It was a whole half teaspoon. And it really gave it a wonderful aroma and sort of a warm flavor. I, I really am going to think of nutmeg as a spice to use with other other vegetables and sort of take it out of its gingerbread box um, because it really made this dish very interesting. And I think that once you try it, it's going to become a staple. I imagine it on, on a plate with a beautiful roasted chicken. It would be wonderful with steak. It would be uh, terrific with lunch with just a a light salad. Or the night that I had it, I just actually roasted a bunch of vegetables and had a big old roasted vegetable bowl for dinner. Um, But however you do it, I think you'll like it. Give it a try, and please do let me know what you think. By now, most of us are well aware that single-use plastics spell trouble for the environment. Many of us have replaced plastic grocery bags with reusable canvas totes, for example. But those bags are far from the only problematic plastic out there. Forward-thinking restaurants are now working to get rid of another all-too-common plastic problem, straws. Ann Curtis wrote about this trend in Edible Louisville and the Bluegrass, where she's the managing editor. Hi, Ann, and thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me, Joy. So what inspired you to cover this topic in the, in the pages of your magazine? You know, it is estimated that by 2050, there will be more plastics in the oceans than fish. And did you know that in the United States alone, approximately 500 million plastic straws are used and discarded each day? Joy, that's enough straw to circumnavigate the planet two and a half times. It's really disturbing. It really is. And so when we learned of these staggering t- statistics, we wanted to raise awareness and offer all easy alternatives. Right. And so did this start with you learning about the the plastic in the ocean, or did you start noticing it around Louisville? Well, you know, actually, it was um, our publisher, Steve Makala, was in California visiting his daughter, mm-hmm. and um, th- it's a huge topic there. And, you know, like any time you travel outside your your own little world, you learn of new things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's why travel is so important. So um, when he came back, he said, wow, we've got to really think about this. So I started doing some research and was pleasantly surprised to see um, a very hopeful situation. So you do cover a few alternatives to plastic straws in your in your piece options that some restaurants are using. Can you tell us about a few of those? Yeah. So we're lucky that the the market is really shifting. Um, so the number of options are increasing. And as the numbers and invention increases, the, the cost comes down, making it so much more affordable for everybody. Mm-hmm. So in Louisville and Lexington, um, hay straws have become really popular. And so we've got many restaurants that have been replacing plastic straws with hay. You know, there are many old standbys that have been around for a while, like acrylic and paper 
paper and metal and glass, but plant-based compostable straws are starting to really rise up. And so bamboo and hay are, are kind of becoming a big thing. So we have some restaurants that have been using hay straws. We have some that have been using metal for in-house eating and then t- hay for uh, take-home orders. Um, but really, you know, I think the bigger trend that we're seeing in a lot of restaurants is they're just not using straws at all. I mean, they're just removing them, elimination completely. Right. I think that's an interesting point. When you start to, I, I bought metal straws for my own use at home and I didn't love using them. So I was I just started using nothing for my iced coffee. Um, and I find that to be not a big deal. Now the hay straws, I've never used those. Can you, what, what are they like? What do they feel like? You know, they're, they're, Sturdy. Um, they're more, they're more sturdy than you think. What's really great about them too is that they're really minimal processing and they're gluten free. Mm-hmm. You know, I think texture has a lot to do with it for people. Um, it you know it's changing a paradigm, right? Right. So like the like the plastic bags, they're you just have to kind of behavior change a little bit and work on that um, and just be more open. But I think you're right. I mean, just not using straws. And I keep a bag of acrylic straws in my purse. Um, so if, if I'm like out and about and, and in a situation where I really would like to use a straw, especially when I'm driving, it's not as easy to to tip that cup up when you're, <laughs> when you're at the wheel. Yeah, that's true. That's a great, a great strategy. Are hay straws something that uh, the average individual person can buy for their home, or is that more of like a restaurant industry thing? Um, I think it's both. Um, I, I think it's accessibility is probably a little challenging right now. I mean, sourcing is kind of an issue. Um, I haven't seen them. Yeah, there aren't a lot of local stores. So I know we do, we try not to promote a lot of big box, you know, Amazon purchasing. Mm-hmm. But um, right, of course. But you also have to kind of meet it where it is to then increase it, right, and increase the demand. So I know there are some local, we do have one local store, Rainbow Blossom. Um, it's a natural food market that offers alternatives. You say in the piece that one of the issues with these plastic straws is they cannot be recycled the way other plastics can. Um, Can you say a little more about that? Why not? Yeah. So as you probably know, plastic straws are made out of type five plastic, also known as uh, polypropylene. And although it can be recycled, most recycling facilities don't accept plastic straws because of the size. So as plastic travels down the conveyor belts while being sorted, small items like bottle caps and straws often fall through the cracks and end up being sent to the landfill. And Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, there aren't many, if any, special straw recycling facilities, which means that when you use a straw, it's going to end up in the landfill forever. Yeah, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, We can be so unconscious about the single use plastics that we just use and discard in a matter of, of minutes. I mean, I have since I read your article, I've definitely been more aware in my own behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, since it came out, have you seen other restaurants uh, eliminate straws? Or what has your feedback been from readers? Yeah, I so when I initially did the research, you know, I did, I, you know, we didn't have a lot of space, so I, I did a quick survey of um, places in town. And since the mm-hmm. articles come out, yeah, people have been coming forward, really sharing other places that have been doing it. There have been some challenges. So some restaurants have challenged other restaurants um, to stop using as well. Um, but I think it's also been kind of a gateway into a, a much larger conversation about uh, single-use plastics and right. takeout containers and just using, being more mindful in general general about water bottles and, you know, all that, that all that stuff. And I, but I, would, I think is also really positive is that it's happening on a national scale too. So, you know, we've had some really large companies kind of jump on board, you know, places like American Airlines and Hyatt and Ikea and Starbucks. So, you know, local endeavors are really important uh, as well as national endeavors, you know, who can have such a dramatic impact. Do you have any quick tips on how, um, you know, just a typical customer might talk to their favorite coffee shop or their favorite restaurant about this issue, you know, without being preachy, um, just to sort of help the message get out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, consumers own the power to drive this change, right? I mean, consumers have the power to drive any change. And so the next time you're ordering your beverage, just simply ask your server to hold the straw, um, e- you know, even if you're in the drive through um, And I, I think just that simple request, it doesn't have to be an overcomplicated situation. I, I do know that one restaurant in Louisville uses that as a, that topic as a platform. So when the customer asks for a straw, they are able to express why they don't use straws. So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's coming from both sides. Um, And I just wanted to touch on one more thing before we wrap up, which is the 
complex issue of plastic straws and people living with disabilities. And you mentioned, you touch on in your article that it is um, a good idea for establishments to have some on hand for this reason. Why is that so important? Yeah, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, plastic straws are really only the viable, uh, the only viable option for many disabled individuals. And that's because many straw alternatives um, kind of create secondary issues. So paper straws and similar biodegradable options fall apart too quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, silicone straws are often not flexible for those with mobility challenges. Reusable straws need to be washed, which can be challenging for some, and metal straws, which conduct heat and cold, in addition to being hard and inflexible, kind of pose a safety risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess we should just keep our eyes on our own cups and, uh, you know, not judge other people for whether they have a straw or not. I guess that's what I took away from it. Um, Exactly. Well, thanks again for covering this, uh, Anne, and for being with us here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for bringing this topic to light. That was Ann Curtis. In addition to her role as managing editor at Edible Louisville and the Bluegrass, she's the board president of Slow Food Bluegrass and the co-host of the radio show, The Local Life. We'll have a link to her article, Straw Poll, and in the show notes for this episode. And you can find Ann on Instagram at edible underscore Louisville. Edible magazines all cover the topic of coffee. Cafes and coffee shops are part of the local food culture all around the world. And of course, coffee can be roasted just about anywhere. But there's really just one edible that can claim coffee as a truly local product, Edible Hawaiian Islands. In a recent issue, the magazine tapped Sean Steinman, a coffee scientist and author, to write an overview of the current coffee scene there. He's with us today to talk more about what's brewing with coffee in Hawaii. Hi, Sean. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Joy. So when most of us think about Hawaii and coffee, we think of Kona. Uh, What does the word Kona really refer to, though? Uh, Kona is a place. So on the big island of Hawaii, there's a political districts all around the island, and there's two of them, a North Kona and a South Kona. And any coffee that's grown in those political districts is Kona coffee. Does all Kona coffee taste the same? No, not at all. There's a huge variation, actually. Huh. Can you tell me a little bit about the range of Kona coffee flavors? Oh, that's a tricky question. I'm going to actually start start with a bit of a quick background, which is, you know, Kona coffee was, uh, for a long time, a bunch of small farmers who all sold their fruit to big processing mills and all got mixed together and homogenized, and you had this sort of sense of a, a single origin flavor. Mm-hmm. But in the last couple of decades, individual farmers have been doing their own things with different varieties and different processes and different uh, ranges of of temperature they grow in. We see a whole range of flavors showing up. In just Kona? In just Kona. The elevation in Kona has quite a range, so you get quite a range of temperature that it grows in. That's interesting. So when you were saying a range, you you get what, what lighter, fruitier coffees and roastier coffees? Well, roastier is a was a artifact of the roasting process, so that could happen anywhere. Right. But if you were to roast all the coffees the same from all over Kona and taste them, you get coffees that are very sort of coffee forward, maybe chocolatey, very simple in their cup, all the way to coffees that are acidy and fruity and floral and have a whole range of nuances in them. Hmm. That's interesting. I think most people think of it as just one thing. But a major thrust of your story is that it's not just Kona coffee coming out of Hawaii anymore and that the industry has expanded to other parts of the island. Can you tell me more about these other regions and how it expanded? Absolutely. So at the late 1970s, 1980s, the big companies that did most of the agriculture in Hawaii were growing sugar and pineapple. And those crops were becoming clearly not going to be profitable anymore. So the companies want to diversify and they tried coffee as one of their crops and they planted big plantations, if you will, or big farms on four different islands, uh, not in concert, but sort of just doing their own things, but sort of doing them at the same time. And we got these four big plantations, which helped uh, the regions outside of Kona become these new coffee growing regions. And once they did that, and once things like the internet happened, where Farmers could have a little farm and get their own coffee roasted and sell it to someone very easily. There was this boon in coffee being grown outside of the Kona region. So we now have coffee growing on five islands and 10 different geographical regions across the state. Are there any other names we should know? Um, Any regions becoming sort of like a name brand like Kona has become? 
Uh, the closest one is probably a region quite close to Kona called Kau on the Big Island. It has done really well in some competitions, and they've got some folks there who are really trying hard to get that name out and recognized and familiar to people. But I'd be remiss not to say that there's amazing coffee coming from all the islands. Maui has a couple of regions up country in Kanapali. There's Oahu and Wailua. There's Molokai. There's Kauai. There's just all sorts of stuff happening. And there's more stuff on the Big Island, in fact. It's, well, it's really exciting. Are these coffees um, ones that we might find in the continental U.S. at our favorite boutique coffee shops? Or are they not making their way over here yet? That's a great question. I Honestly, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure. I'll have to keep a lookout. I suspect that there are, without question, there are some boutique coffee shops that have them. But Hawaiian coffee is, is there's not very much of it and it's pretty expensive. So mm-hmm. it can only end up in places where there are lots of interested coffee drinkers. Speaking of that expense, you mentioned in your article that there are challenges to growing coffee and producing coffee in Hawaii. The cost of living and doing business there being one of them. Can you say a little bit more about those challenges and how people are facing them? Yeah. Well, that I think the best way to think about it is there there is quite a, a higher cost of production because we're out in the middle of nowhere and we're in the United States, which is unusual to be growing tropical crops. And so we have a baseline more expensive coffee. But then we also have people who are Americans who want to live like Americans. And for that to happen, and this is true across all industries, not just coffee, that we need to make our things more expensive and coffee is no different. So how do people deal with that? Well, you, people deal with it by creating stories and getting connected to their buyers and saying, look, I'm a face here. I'm a real person. And you know, you want to support this idea of buying American and buying local. And this is the best you can do when it comes to coffee. And then you just also strive to make really great coffee. And if the cup is really great, people are also more inclined to be okay with spending more money on it. I think that's really true. We're seeing um, in coffee shops, people willing to pay quite a bit more than was once true, I think, especially in these types of shops where they have single origin pour overs. Um, at least I'm seeing that on the East Coast in Philadelphia. So I, I think that that's probably only going to grow. I agree. I'm a coffee lover, so I'm certainly willing to pay a little more for a very interesting cup of coffee. Um, you mentioned that some of the coffee uh, farms in Hawaii are starting to grow different varieties than in the past, and that uh, most of the coffee beans grown have been a variety called Tipica. And now there's some some new varieties being cultivated only on Hawaii. Can you can you tell us what some of those are? Yeah, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to expand that and talk about all the other different varieties. Um, so for most of our history, we've been growing Tipica from one place or another. And it wasn't until really the, the burgeoning of specialty coffee and the internet where farmers started thinking, oh, we should try different things to make different flavors. And that was probably late 90s, early 2000s. And we had a bunch of common varieties that you'll find all around the world, Bourbons and Catuais and Caturas and Things are sort of considered heirloom varieties, if you will. But also at this time when specialty coffee began developing, folks here realized that it would be great to have varieties that were truly Hawaiian varieties that nobody else in the world had. So there was a breeding program started by a private industry group done at a private research center that developed, aimed to develop new varieties based on you know crosses from the things we had here, these these heirloom varieties. And just this year, one was released called Mamo, which is a stable variety that is a, a hybrid of these of two varieties, um, Mocha and I think Margo Hipe or Tipica. Now I can't remember. Gosh, what terrible expert I am. Uh, it's a really spectacular variety available from a single farm. And then there's other of these varieties from this trial that are, that are out and about scattered around the state. They're harder to find because they're not as well established. But they do exist. And so we now have this beginnings, if you will, of truly Hawaiian coffee varieties. It's, it's really spectacular. That's so cool. And if somebody was interested in tasting those, um, can they be mail ordered and shipped? Do you, do you know if that's possible? I'm pretty sure it's possible. The one called Mamo is exclusively available from Greenwell Farms in Kona. Can you say that again? Uh, Greenwell come, Farms? Yeah. Greenwell Farms. Correct. Cool. That's, um, it sounds easily Googleable. Very easily Googleable. And, and you no, know, it's just a cool historical note. Greenwell Farms is probably the oldest continuous coffee farm in Hawaii. They have hmm. they've been in, in operation since the eighteen fifties, maybe earlier. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, the way I want to taste this coffee is I think I just need to visit Hawaii. I don't see why that would be a problem. You know, what are shipping costs? It's probably going to be about as expensive to just go. <laughs> have, have coffee on the beach. Um, Especially during the winter, right? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty It's pretty chilly here today um, where I'm talking to you from in Philadelphia. So you also wrote intriguingly about the role of technology in coffee cultivation. 
obviously coffee cultivation has been around a really long time. Um, and I'm really interested to hear more about how modern technology is changing the way we produce coffee in Hawaii. Okay. Well, there's on most, most farms in Hawaii, like most farms in the world, they're quite small, just a few acres. And in terms of modern technology, uh, it tends to be tractors and small things that easily go through the farm. And this, I wouldn't say it's super modern, but it's pretty commonplace here. But when we think of really cutting edge technology, there is a farm on Kauai that is really, they're a large farm, they're about 3,000 acres. And they are really pushing the envelope with using modern technology. They use drones to check things out. They have sensors in the ground that report back to a central hub and helps them decide when to irrigate, where to irrigate, when to fertilize, which is uh, not exactly a water thing, but it's related. And they've got these really spectacular cameras on their uh, machine harvesters that look at the color and report back to the machine and the driver how they should be manipulating their machine to best use it to harvest. And this is just the beginning of what they're looking to do. They have very open minds and they're very interested in exploring. Is the goal to produce higher yields or just better tasting coffee or simply be more efficient? All of those things. Clearly, more yields per unit area tends to be more profitable, but also optimizing the health of the tree and the, the ripeness of the fruit when it's harvested translates to a better tasting cup. And that's what every farmer wants, the better tasting cup and more of it. And saving money in the process. You mentioned something very intriguing to edible readers, this phrase, farm to cup coffee house. Now, most of us cannot imagine such a thing. Obviously, coffee is not grown in most of the of North America. So paint me a picture of what the farm to cup coffee house is all about. Surprisingly, or maybe not too surprisingly, it's still a pretty rare idea. Uh, just because, you know, it's hard to be an expert in any one thing. Imagine trying to be an expert in many one things. So in this case, an example I wrote about in the, in the in the article is a company called Kona Coffee and Tea, and it's a family-run operation. They have a pretty sizable farm, and they're longtime Kona residents, and they wanted to not just have coffee to sell to someone around the world. They wanted to support their local community and, and share the story of Hua locally. So they opened a cafe some years ago, and the only thing their cafe sells is their coffee. So all the coffee they grow, different. they have one variety, but they do different processes and different roast levels, and they do different things. And you go in their cafe, and you can drink their coffee, prepare in all kinds of ways. It's uh, really unusual. I mean, for most crops, it's pretty unusual to do this. Almost like the closest thing you might have in the mainland is often, anyways, it's you know, a farmer's market where a farmer can you know grow something and cook it or prepare it to serve it in some kind of form at a market. Um, very few restaurants right, are able to grow their own food and sell it on the restaurants that they do exist. So this is pretty rare, and it's a great chance to meet farmers and roasters and coffee shop owners for all the same person. Talk about an opportunity for storytelling. True, true. That's really an, an amazing chance for to connect with someone who's very knowledgeable about how the cup that you're drinking was was produced. That's something that I think would be really cool, and um, I'm surprised. I think we'll probably see more of that in Hawaii. Um, it just seems like something people would connect with so much. So that's one of the most amazing opportunities and realities of Hawaii is that you can easily connect with the farmers. All of our farmers are modern Americans. They have phones or email or certainly mailboxes. It's very easy to connect with these farmers and the farmers will want to connect with people and customers because they're excited about what they're doing and they, of course, want to make connections with people and they want to tell people, look, this is how it really happens. This is why it's so much work and there's so much risk and there's so much quality and there's you know, so much everything. You don't get to do that when you go into your fancy cafe in most of the world. They just don't have an opportunity. But here you can come visit. You don't even have to visit. Just go to their website. Mm -hmm. and you can connect with these people and, and everybody, the, the stories create themselves. And that's what you know, Slow Food's about. That's what Farm the Table's about. It's really you know, learning about where your product comes from. And it's so easy to do in Hawaii you know, with Hawaiian products like coffee. Your story was so full of tidbits and little intriguing pieces of information. Um, and we're going to link to it in the show notes. But I just have one more thing that I have to ask you about before we go. Sure. You write about how some coffee businesses are using other parts of the plant to make coffee adjacent products. Can you tell me about some of those? Like, I was especially intrigued by the notion of a, of a coffee bar, like instead of a chocolate bar. Yeah, I, I'm really good friends with the folks who do this. They're a wonderful farm. They make great coffee, and they're just delightful people. And they wanted to diversify. I don't know why. I never asked them why. Uh, but they decided that what if you can use coffee, roasted coffee, and, and 
treat it the way you might chocolate or cacao and turn it into an edible object. In many iterations and much experimentation, they've come up with this delicious, what do you want to call it? Coffee bar, a candy bar. It's very much like a chocolate bar, but instead of made from cacao, it's made from coffee. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's edible coffee, if you will, but done really well. A lot of people who use coffee in food products don't necessarily use really great coffee to start with, really well roasted coffee, but these guys are really passionate about everything. And so this bar is really fun and interesting and do you, do you happen to know what the caffeine is from something like that? They claim that it's a it, it's about the same as a few shots of espresso. I think two huh. or four. It's on the label, so it's easy to find out. Interesting. Yeah. It seems like it would be a concentrated source of, of caffeine, which sometimes is a really good thing. It's a really good thing. And the reality is with any you know snack bar, like a chocolate bar or coffee bar, you don't have to eat the whole thing at once. So you can sort of enjoy the flavor and mitigate the caffeine. Intake. Well, maybe you don't have to eat the whole thing at once. <laughs> I might have to. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Sean. It was really great to talk to you about this piece. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I really am honored. That was Sean Steinman, founder of Kofia Consulting and co-owner of Daylight Mind Coffee Company. We'll have a link to his article, What's New in Coffee Across Hawaii, in the show notes for this episode. Check out his book, The Hawaii Coffee Book and The Little Coffee Know-It-All. Thank you for joining us today on Edible Potluck. Our podcast producer is David Wolf. If you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to leave us a rating or a review. You know it helps other listeners find the podcast. Don't forget to pick up a copy of your own local Edible magazine. If you don't know where to get one, find out at ediblecommunities.com. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes for this episode at ediblecommunities.com slash podcast. Until next time, remember, eat local. <laughs>